And he says, if I set you free, he says, you're, you're free indeed. You know, there's a lot of people today still living in darkness that they haven't heard about the freedom in, in Christ yet. So I'm glad you're here this morning. If you need a church bulletin, go ahead and raise your hand. We'll get you a church bulletin. There's an outline of today's sermon. You can fill in the blanks as we go along. And on the back side, it corresponds to all the scripture and the page number to the Pew Bible in front of you or under the seat in, in front of you. If you don't have one, look around. I'm sure there's one to the, to the right or left. So if you want to follow along and you don't know where in the Bible, just grab a Pew Bible in front of you and look for the, the, the page number. It'd be a lot, lot easier to, to find it. You know, someone asked me in the first service, how can people make it through this world without Jesus? You know, in the light of all the, the evil, in the light of the darkness and all the, uh, everything that is going on, how can people possibly make it in this world without, without Jesus? Uh, you know, because Jesus is the answer. Jesus is our help. There's a club in Chicago called Hell's Gate. And it just so happens that it's next to a street called Calvary. So someone once was trying to find directions to, to Hell's Gate one time, and they said, oh, that's easy, just go past Calvary. And you'll be at Hell's Gate. And there's so much truth to that because the only way to Hell's Gate is to go past Calvary. To go past the place where Jesus was crucified on the cross. You know, the, the, the cross epitomized God's grace. God's grace is an attribute of his character, who, who he is. Grace runs all through the Bible. Um, anyone ever been to SeaWorld? You remember when they try to uh, ride Shamu and they put their arms around Shamu? Uh, that's how I think it is when we try to understand what God's grace is. It's like trying to get our arms around Shamu. It's hard for us to, to wrap our minds around God's grace. It's hard for us to understand God's grace. J.I. Packer describes God's grace this way. In the New Testament, grace means God's moving heaven and earth to save sinners who couldn't save uh, who could not lift a finger to save themselves. Grace means God sending his only son to descend into hell on the cross so that we guilty ones might be reconciled with God and received into heaven. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we could be the righteousness of God. Grace is free. Grace gives us what we don't deserve, but grace gives us what God delights to give us. You can't earn God's grace. You can't work for God's grace. Grace can be summed up in one word, and that's forgiven. An acrostic I, I came across one time, if you would put the word grace like this, use it as an acrostic. And G stands for God's. The R stands for riches. The A stands for at. The C for Christ. And E for expense. So grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. I like that. That's a good explanation of what grace is. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 1 this morning. Page 1866 in your pew Bible. To try to get an understanding of God's grace. To try to get an understanding of this Jesus Christ that we worship and, and serve. So if you would, turn to Revelation chapter 1. As we go through Revelation 1, I'm just going to point out some things to you. So try to follow along with me as, as we, we go through the book of Revelation. First of all, the title of the book, Revelation 1, says what? The title of the book is The Revelation of Jesus Christ. You see it? That's the title of the book. Now, who is the audience? The audience is which God gave him to show his servants. So who's the audience? His servants. Right? The slave, bond slaves of Jesus Christ. So if you're not a servant of Jesus Christ, this book is not for you. The subject of this book is what must soon take place. Remember that throughout this sermon. The subject of this book is what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to a servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. This is the only book in the Bible that says if you read it, you'll be blessed. The author John is 90 years old at this time, and he's writing to the seven churches in the province of Asia, 
today Asia Minor, or modern-day Turkey. The publisher of this book is Grace and Peace to You from Him. So who's the publisher of this book? It's from Him, from God, who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits before his throne, that doesn't mean seven individual spirits. Seven in the Bible represents wholeness and completeness, as the earth was created in seven days. Uh, so this means uh, the completeness or wholeness of, uh, or the presence of the Holy Spirit at the throne room of, of God. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. The dedication of this book, who is this book dedicated to? Well, it's to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen? Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega. These are the Greek, Greek words for the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. So when you see Alpha and the Omega, it basically means the beginning and the end. So he says, I am the beginning of time and I am the end of time. Right? I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Look at verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. Now, wait a minute. When did God die? Jesus Christ died. And on the third day, he rose again, right? I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death. And Hades. Would you pray? Father, Lord, we come into your house to worship you, to magnify your name, to exalt you, Lord. Father, we live in a time where the hearts of many are growing cold. As the the evil just increases more and more, we just seem to become numb to it. Uh, Our hearts aren't affected as, as it used to be. We just think in our hearts and our minds, just another shooting. Just things are just getting more more, more evil, and we've come to accept it. But Father, I pray that as your people, as your church, we will never accept it. That, Father, that uh, uh, we will cry out to you, Father Lord, that you will use us to make a difference in this world, that you'll use us to bring peace into this, this world, to, to set the captives free, Father Lord. Lord, I pray that you will not let anyone come here to church today whose life is still in sin and leave without responding to the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, may they hear the power of the cross and leave being set free from sin. Because, Father, we know that their condition would be worse of having not even heard at all than to hear and to turn their back on you. So, Father, cut to the heart this morning. Anoint this message. Give me your words to proclaim. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Three truths I want to learn about this passage of Scripture. Number one, God demonstrated His love for us. God demonstrated His love for us. When did God start loving you? He never did. He never did. He never started because He's always loved you. He told Jeremiah, He said, before I formed you in the womb, I, I, I knew you. God has always known you. He's always loved you. He's always cared for you. Get this through your head. God doesn't love you because you're lovable. He doesn't love you because you're you're, you're lovable. And he doesn't love you for what you can do. So why does God love us then? One word, grace. One word, grace. That's okay, man. What? what, Why does God love us, Sam? No, Sam, man. That's all right. It's cool. Sam, I respect what you say, so don't worry. You raise your hand any time, all right? All right. But don't get the idea that you can make yourself lovable to to God. It's been said one time God was asked, well, how much do you love me? And he spread out his arms. He said this much, and he died on the cross for our sins. For God so loved you, the world, he gave his one and only son, so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. 
You know, sometimes we get the idea, you know, if I could just act better, if I could just clean myself up and act better, then maybe God will love me. Then maybe God will love me more. Understand something. God wants you to do these things. It's not bad to do it. He wants you to do that. But you cannot earn God's love. Do you know that? God cannot love you any more than he does right now. He loves you right now. He may not love what you do, but he loves you. Do you understand that? He loves you. He loves you. Did I ever tell you that he loves you? <laughs> tell your neighbor he loves you. Tell your neighbor he loves you. All right. And he loves you by sheer grace. By sheer, when he looks at Jeff Roman, he doesn't say, wow. He probably goes, whoa. Right? <laughs> but he loves me anyhow. And he loves you anyhow. A man put an ad in a paper one time for his missing dog. And it read like this. Dog missing. $100 reward. Dog has bare spots on his fur because of a bad case of mange. He's blind in one eye due to being shot with a BB gun. He walks with a limp after being hit by a car and having his hind leg broken. And he answers to the name of Lucky. <laughs> you see, he was a lucky dog. Because he had someone who cared enough about him to offer a $100 reward and go looking for him. And we may not be lucky dogs... But we got someone in heaven who cares enough about us, who left his throne room of grace to come down to earth and to pay our fine. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. That's how much he loves us. Amen? Amen. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Number two, he freed us from our sins by his blood. That's how lucky we are. We are lucky dogs in a sense. Because at one time we were in darkness. We were captive by, by, by sin. Look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. To him who loves us. Did you catch that? He loves you. Boy, if you don't leave it here knowing anything today. If you wonder, what was that sermon about? I want you to remember that one sentence. I remember the pastor said he loves me. God loves you. God's word says he loves you. I am the living one or, uh, to him who loves us. And he has freed us from our sins by his blood. So it's almost like his blood here is like a key, isn't it? A key that has unlocked a gate, that has opened up the gate to, to free us from sin, to see us, free us from darkness, the demonic strongholds, the consequences of sin. He has freed us by his blood. We're getting ready to partake the Lord's Supper. And the Bible uh, tells us in Hebrews 9, 22, without the shedding of blood, there is not forgiveness of sins. So he freed us by his blood. Look at verse 18. It says, I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and I hold the keys to death and, and Hades. The blood is the key that sets us free. Did you catch that? The blood is the key that sets us free. Understand something. The blood that flowed through baby Jesus' veins was not Mary's blood. The blood that flowed through baby Jesus' veins was not Joseph's blood. The blood that flowed through Jesus' veins was God's blood. Jesus died on the cross. He's the perfect sacrifice for our sin. God loves us so much, he left his throne to come down to heaven to die on the cross for us. Jesus said, if I set you free, you will be free indeed. We can be sure of it. Why? Because his blood was sacrificed for our sins. If you would, turn to Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Don't lose your place in Revelation, but look at page uh, 1692 in your pew Bible. How many of you have heard Christians, or maybe you've said it to self, yourself, you know what, I'm spiritual but not religious. I don't need church. I don't need church. I've met people like that, and it's, it's not biblical. And I say that because, you know why? The church is not this building. The church 
Right here, look around you. We're the church. We're the living stones that make up the body of Christ. The church is not a building. Jesus didn't die on the cross for a building. Look at Acts 20, 28. Be shepherds of the church of Jeff Roman. By who? Of what? Whose church is it? God. Be shepherds of the church of God. God established the church, which he bought at his own, with his own blood. How expensive was, was the church? God purchased the church with his own blood. So don't tell me church is not important. God thought it was important enough for, to die on the cross and shed his blood to establish his church. We're his church. We're his people. We're set free from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. So Jesus has the keys. The key is his blood. Now, where are the keys right now? Ah, good question. Look at Matthew 16, verse 19. Matthew 16, verse 19. You there? What did Jesus tell Peter? When, when, when Jesus asked Peter, who do people say I am? Peter said, I'm the Messiah. He said, you have answered correctly, Peter. Upon your testimony of who I am, I will build my church. Jesus established a church. And he says, I will give you what? The keys to the kingdom. What are the keys? The blood of Jesus Christ. Did you ever think about this? It hit me after the first service, so you're lucky to hear it now. <laughs> everybody you meet, everybody you meet, you have the keys. If they're in darkness, you have the key to set them free. Did you ever think about that? If you have Jesus Christ, you have the key to set somebody free from sin and darkness. God has given us the keys to the kingdom. We have the power. You know, when I was in the army, I had all these keys. I was a first sergeant, and I had key to every, I mean, I, I was important, right? Because that's what keys symbolize. Keys symbolize authority, power, control, right? I had a lot of keys. My kids wanted many keys when, when they were growing up. They wanted to be just like Dad and have a lot of, a lot of keys. Keys have the power to, to set someone free or to lock someone up, right? Keys have, are, are symbolic of authority and power. You have the keys to the kingdom. Do you understand that? Everybody you meet, you could say, you know what? I have the key to set you free. What is that key? The key is Jesus Christ. His blood has set you free. That's the key. Do you understand that? That's, the, that's what we have as his church. Uh, let me ask you this. Who, who holds the key to your house? Who's got the key to your house? You do, right? Now, what happens when you sell the house? You give up the key. Now, what made you give up that key? The house, why is not the house yours anymore? What happened? What transferred the ownership of that house? There's a title. A title deed that transfers the ownership of that house. When you sell that house, you give up the keys. Right? Let's look back at Genesis chapter 1. Look back at Genesis chapter 1. Verse 26. Then God, are you with me? I'm sorry. Yeah? Everyone with me? Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28, God blessed them. And said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over every living creature that moves on the ground. So basically what God did is 
Well, God told Adam, you're to name every living creature. And when you apply a name to someone, that implies ownership. And then he says, you're to subdue the earth. You're to rule the earth. In other words, God created this beautiful world that we live in. And God gave ownership of this world to Adam. Right? God told Adam and Eve, we talked about this last Sunday, do not eat from the knowledge of tree and evil in the middle of the garden. They did anyhow. When they did, they disobeyed God, they obeyed the devil, or obeyed Satan. When they did that, they essentially gave the title deed of this world to the devil. And now this whole world that we live in is under the control of the evil one. Get out of here, pastor. No, really. Really. Genesis 1.31, God says when he created everything, it was very good. We didn't have sickness and death and the things that we see going on in this world today. This whole world we live in is under the control of the evil one. Look at 1 John 5, 19, if you would. Page 1861 in your pew Bible. I've got to move sort of fast, okay? Because I want to get, get... We won't be able to cover everything, but you'll, you'll get the general idea. Are you with me? 1 John 5, 19, 1861 in your pew Bible. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of whom? Who? The evil one. This whole world. You see, God didn't create this world, the mess that we're living in. People say, well, why did God allow so much suffering well, God allows us to choose, and as a result of making bad choices, calling disobeying God, they're suffering in the world, and that's called sin. We're reaping the consequences of sin. We live in a fallen world. Look at Luke chapter 4, verse 5, page 1565 in your pew Bible. Luke chapter 4, verse 5, page 1565 in your pew Bible. Are you with me? This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He's led out into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by, by the devil. This is at the beginning of it, and this is his third and final temptation. And it says, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of this world. Imagine that. And he said to him, I'll give you all their authority and splendor for it has been given to me. Who gave it to him? Adam did. Because Adam had all authority and he gave it to the devil. He says, it's been given to me. And he says, I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will be yours. You know what the temptation here was? Jesus was born for the sole purpose of dying on the cross for our sins. His blood was to be the key that set us free. Because the wages of sin is death, Jesus paid the perfect sacrifice. And Satan's temptation here was, you don't have to go to the cross, Jesus. If you'll just worship me, I'll give it to you. But as we know, Satan's a liar, isn't he? He's a liar. God's word calls Jesus the second Adam. Just as we were all brought into sin because of the first Adam, we're all brought into righteousness because of what the second Adam does. 1 Corinthians 15, 47 says, the first man was of dust of the earth, the second man was from heaven. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 says, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. In Revelation chapter 4, if you would, turn there, please. Chapter 5, I mean. And we're, we're wrapping up here. I've got I to move along. 1872 in your pew Bible. Revelation chapter 5 has to deal with the scroll, opening up the scroll, okay? And on the scroll, the, the scroll was written in papyrus or sheepskin, and they would roll up the scroll. And along the way, they would put seals on the edge, and they would roll up a little bit more and put another seal. Roll it up a little bit more and another seal. So now we're at a point in Revelation where John has a vision. And he starts crying because no one is worthy to open up the scroll. 
And each of the seals talks about bringing judgment upon the earth. And they're crying, who is worthy to open up the scroll? I'll tell you the one who is worthy. It's the one who reclaimed the title deed to this world. He's the one who's worthy. You see, when Jesus died on the cross and rose again on the third day, he reclaimed the title deed to this world. He owns this world, and one day he's coming back to reclaim ownership. As we talked about in Revelation chapter 1, in the beginning, it's going to happen soon. The closing date is going to happen soon. Right? Revelation chapter 5, verse 4, he says, I wept because no one was worthy to open the scroll. Verse 5, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open up the scroll. And what's interesting is Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 through 10. It says, the angel started singing a song. This is the second time in the Bible we have a record of angels singing. You know, the first time the angels sang was in Job. We, we read about in Job, where God created the world and the angels sang. At the beginning of creation, the angels sang. And they haven't sung since. Not until Jesus Christ reclaimed this world again. Not until Jesus Christ reclaimed the title deed of this world again. And the angels are singing again in heaven. And it's just a matter of time until Jesus, again, establishes his earthly kingdom here on earth. Amen? Amen. Number three. He has made us to be kings, queens, and priests. Look back at Revelation 1.6. Revelation 1, 6 says, And he has made us kings and priests unto God, his Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. I want to ask you this. I'm not talking about TV. In person, have you ever seen a real king or queen in person? Yes, you have. Look to your neighbor left and right. You know what? The Bible says through Christ, we have Christ's royal blood running through our veins. And it says we are kings and queens. Do you understand that? Because he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and we're his children. We're now part of his family. We have a royal inheritance. Do you understand that? Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, page 1847 in your pew Bible. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Now, this here was a, a totally different doctrine to me. It's called the priesthood of the believer. And I was brought up in a faith where I had to go to a priest and confess my sins. And the only way I could really have a relationship with God was through that priest. So I had to do a paradigm shift when I, when I, when I started really reading the Bible. Because first chapter 2, verse 9 tells me what? But you... Are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're God's special possession that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. You're praising with the angels, right? Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received His mercy. You don't need anyone else to go to God now. Do you understand that? You don't need a priest. Why? Because you are a priest. You are a king. You are a queen. God is no farther from you than you hitting your knees on the ground. Do you understand that? I remember trying to explain to my, my parents, what's the difference between what you believe and what we believe? And I said, well, I don't have to pray to anybody else but God. I have direct access to God. And they started laughing at me, they almost mockingly. But you know, it's It's biblical. It's biblical. Because we have the great high priest who interceded on our behalf. And now he has made us priests. He has made us kings and queens. He has given us the keys to the kingdom of God. Do you know that? Who's his representative here on earth? You. You got his blood running through your veins, whether you realize it or not. As we said in the book of Revelation, this book is to the saints. To the servants of God. Blessed will you be if you not just hear the word, but do what it says. We're going to have a time of invitation. How do you get to hell's gate? 
Just bypass Calvary. That's all you got to do. I want to ask you this morning, have you ever stopped at Calvary? Have you ever had a point in your life where you made a personal decision for Jesus Christ? Have you ever made a point where you surrendered your life to God and come forward? You know, you can come forward and you can stay right where you're at. It doesn't matter. The point is to make Jesus, well, not make, you don't make him. You recognize Jesus as Lord of your life. He is Lord. You don't make him Lord. Let's have a time right now. Father, I pray right now, Father Lord, that if someone is here today who doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, that this will be the day that they receive the key of your blood to set them free from the demonic strongholds of their lives. Father, let the scales lift from their eyes. Let them, let them see. Give them, give them faith to believe and a willing spirit to respond. Father, you have come to set the captives free. And we know that no one is here by accident this morning, Lord. We know that those without Christ suffer loss and death and are still under a cruel master, separated from God. But we who are in Christ, Father, uh, we have worth in your eyes. We have received your incredible love and grace. And you love us not because of anything we have done. But we have just accepted your grace. We can do nothing to earn our salvation. We can do nothing to earn our, your love. But we just accept it as the gift that it is. So, Father, if if there is someone here this morning who hasn't received that gift, who hasn't accepted that gift, help them to realize that they can't do anything but just receive the gift. So, Father, work your spirit in the lives of those who are here this morning who need to receive that gift. And for those who already have received that gift, Father, maybe we've lost our way, we've forgotten who we are. And we're living like paupers in this world. We're we're not paupers. We're priests. We're kings. We're queens. And we hold the keys to the kingdom of God. So, Father, let us always be on the lookout for those who need to be set free. And let us not be weary in doing good. For your word says at the proper time, we're going to reap the harvest. So, Father, as things get darker, may your light shine brighter through each and every one of our lives. And may we always be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I mean, down here to meet you. You respond as the Lord.